need the mic, right? I thought I was loud enough. <laughs> I called the Committee of Economic Development uh, meeting in order. Um, I acknowledge that a quorum is present. Uh, we have two sets of minutes. Um, Rob Igo, have you had a chance to look over the minutes of January 25th? I have, Madam Chair. I would seek to move those, <laughs> those minutes. All right. Well, Rep. Igo moves the minutes of January 25th. Any questions or corrections? All those in favor of adopting the minutes say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. The minutes are adopted. <coughs> uh, Rep. Uh, Feist, have you had a chance to look at the minutes on February 1st? Rep. Feist moves the minutes of February 1st. Any questions or corrections? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries and we adopt the minutes of uh, February 1st. Um, today we have a bill, uh, House File 189. Rep. Hansen, since you're not in the committee, I'll move your bill. Uh, chair moves. Uh, House File 189 to be referred to the capital investment. Welcome to the committee and present your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. House File 189 relates to the 1927 American Legion Memorial Library uh, in the city of South St. Paul. Uh, there is a new library being built in the city of South St. Paul as it's being incorporated into the uh, county library system. Uh, so we have this historic building uh, uh, in the middle of town that we are trying to find uh, a use for. I have with me today Ryan Garcia, who is the city manager for the city of South St. Paul, to provide details. Thank you, Representative Hanson, Madam Chair, and uh, Welcome committee. Welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself Thank for you. the record and proceed. Yes, uh, Ryan Garcia. I'm the city administrator for the city of South St. Paul. Um, uh, we we thank you and acknowledge the uh, consideration of House File 189 today. Um, South St. Paul, is, as I'm sure most know, is, is a city with a long uh, history. Uh, just to provide a bit of context, our community has weathered uh, change over the last 50 years, and uh, we're really going through a, a, another transition uh, here in, in the early 2000s. Um, our community is, from a demographic standpoint, has, uh, has struggled with uh, relatively slow and low growth. Uh, for really the last generation uh, overall, but we have seen the dynamics of our community change. Uh, poverty in our community uh, as evidenced through free and reduced lunch at our, uh, within our school system uh, as over 50% of our students uh, rely on that program. Uh, our elementary system uh, is, is home to uh, more than 40% of its population being uh, Latino descent. Um, and uh, this is a change for the city of South St. Paul. Um, a positive one, but one that uh, has impacted uh, sort of our perspective and ability to um, to focus on uh, providing community assets and preserving uh, community assets, such as the 1927 American Legion Library. Uh, so the project itself, uh, what we're seeking uh, assistance with, is really helping to redefine uh, the use of this uh, of this uh, critical asset within our community. It's obviously owned by our community and beloved by our community. Uh, it's been in the city, really in the heart of town, uh, for almost 100 years. And while grateful for the partnership of Dakota County uh, in, uh, in uh, constructing a new public library for our residents and the residents of the broader uh, Dakota County area to enjoy, uh, we are left with, uh, with a bit of a question as to what to do with, with our 1927 library. Uh, so what we're seeking assistance with, uh, being that it's an older building and does suffer from some deferred maintenance, uh, we are looking for assistance with uh, assessing uh, hazardous materials within the building, so asbestos-containing materials, uh, lead-based paint. Uh, we are looking for uh, an analysis of uh, code compliance issues, uh, that being the building code, uh, the energy code, and of course the American, uh, with Americans with Disabilities Act compliance. Uh, in addition to, the, to those uh, efforts, we will, would like to engage uh, the community actively and proactively uh, in determining <clears throat> how the community best sees the city utilizing this facility into the future. As I mentioned, currently there isn't a, 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 a defined reuse for the building. Uh, we do uh, acknowledge uh, the history and would like to determine uh, what 
what it is that the community feels we should uh, invest in for the future of that building. And then finally, uh, the bulk of, of the request is for, uh, is for actual uh, engineering and architectural design uh, of the facility for the reuse uh, that is uh, determined to be uh, desired by the community. So I do thank you again for your time and for the consideration of this bill uh, and would be happy to answer any further questions about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have an amendment, um, A1, and Rep. Wiener, uh, would you like to move your amendment? I would like to move my amendment, Madam Chair. Thank you. Can you explain the amendment? Yes, the amendment that I presented here would require the city to have matching funds. Um, looked at the project itself, love the history, uh, but when a project like this has some financial responsibility, it helps uh, tie the project into the city and, and the requirements. Um, the other thing that I would like to see is a report with the uh, details about the grant um, at the conclusion of the study so that uh, some accountability, uh, we've seen this in other, other uh, committees and forth, so forth about uh, when the money is being spent, uh, what is the outcome? So that my amendment uh, does both of those things. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, unfortunately, I would encourage a no vote on the amendment. Uh, I think the accountability protections that are, uh, this is a grant to the city of South St. Paul. Uh, they will be voting on things. There will be hearings. It's going to be on the city webpage. Uh, there's going to be clear uh, transparency as it being uh, with the city. In addition, uh, there will be intangible matches that are going there. I think this is the part that we, as a, as a poor community, do not have the funds for. Uh, you know, generally I do support matching when there's a capital project, but I don't think we've ever um, required match for a study. So I would oppose the amendment. Thank you. Rep. Wiener, do you have any more questions? <coughs> any other discussion? Minority lead? Go? Well, I was going to say about the match. Um, I believe there's options available. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Still getting used to the process. I apologize. It's all right. Um, I believe there's options available for the matching grants. Um, Legacy Foundation or Legacy Fund, a few other things that would not necessarily make it on the responsibility of the city, but so, so uh, the city would have a little bit of skin in the game, so to speak. Although I hate that phrase, but... Uh, I believe there's options out there that funds don't necessarily have to come from the city, but would have to be matched one form or another with the city's uh, uh, time and effort. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Lead Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I understand, you know, Lakeville has a kind of a historic downtown, so I understand some of the historic uh, issues around historic buildings, um, but I'm not sure that the economic development is why that's necessarily coming to our committee. Um, does the city, do you have, does the city have an economic development um, committee or, or council or, and I think the city gets a quite handsome amount of local government aid. Uh, why are they coming to the state to do this? And I guess maybe I'd ask staff uh, if they're familiar with uh, a grant like this for uh, just a building study of what to do with the building. Um, and he'd mentioned, uh, you know, some structural engineering and that kind of stuff, I, I did hear that. Have we, are you familiar, uh, have we done this in the committee in the past? Um, just a straight out grant, no matching funds, because I'm not even sure we should, that I'm sold on the idea. I think the matching grant part in the amendment uh, has some merit, but have we done this in the Economic Development Committee before? Anna. Chair and members, Anna Shalene, House Research. We have funded studies for projects in the past. Uh, I can think of a couple examples. Well, I can think of one example, but uh, it is something we have done. And Rep. Hansen or, or folks from the city, whoever wants to ch chime on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. If, if you look at line 1.2, it's an act relating to capital investment, and that's where the bill's going, uh, uh, Representative Kosnick. So. I believe it came here because in your repurposing, we may look at that as a business development or some, uh, we, we're not predetermining where it goes to. But I, I think you know, Representative Kosnick, that the city of South St. Paul is still the only city in the state that is recognized by the U.S. Department of Commerce as economically 
disadvantaged and that's because of the closure of the stockyards over 40 years ago so we still have that designation because of some of the challenges in terms of poverty job loss reconstruction so the capacity that's why we get more LGA we have older housing stock less business so we're asking for this and I think uh, uh, manager Garcia uh, could highlight more Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, <laughs> Representative Kuznick, thank you for the question. We do have, uh, the City of South St. Paul does have an Economic Development Authority um, that, does, uh, that does work very hard to, um, to identify opportunities for business growth, business development, and redevelopment in our community as a fully built out community. Uh, we do deal with these sorts of challenges, older buildings with um, maybe undefined, uh, undefined end uses uh, that we need to consider. Um, for some context, uh, you know, the city uh, obviously has, uh, has gone through a couple of waves of sort of um, reinvention, for lack of a better word, uh, established in 1887. We really saw our first wave of sort of the second generation of what the city was gonna be in the uh, 1960s and 70s. And frankly, uh, there was a significant investment at that, at that time in public facilities such as this one, basically across the board. Uh, and today, in 2023, uh, really we're facing um, a number of competing challenges uh, for you know critical and core public infrastructure uh, water and sewer uh, our public works maintenance facilities our fire stations um, where uh, this this uh, this particular facility is is one on a relatively long list for a small community like ours to uh, to address um, at the same time we are uh, you know the city is uh, at its sort of at its own expense undertaking an effort uh, to really define what our uh, public service and administrative and operational uh, needs are and where that fits within our uh, current uh, regime of buildings that we have. Uh, this is one of the buildings, frankly, that we're not certain um, uh, is necessarily needed for, uh, for housing city functions, uh, governmental functions. So we are, again, not predetermined, but we are keeping an eye on the opportunity to potentially see this be a public-private partnership where uh, it could be an opportunity for small business growth or a, or a partnership in the future. So um, we're really trying to uh, make that determination through this process, really clearly define uh, what the challenges of any reuse to this building are, but hopefully a more tailored reuse that, again, might be a, uh, clearly in line with uh, economic development function. So I hope that helped to answer the question. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Uh, just a last uh, follow-up, and I don't know if other members uh, have any comments, but uh, Chair Hanson, I, I did uh, appreciate pointing out the capital investment part because th that adds a little bit more scrutiny to the process. I think uh, I haven't served on that committee, but I think they'd like uh, additional matching funds in there. Um, I appreciate the efforts, and I have supported the historic tax credit for older buildings to reuse. Um, I don't know if this is something that would probably, it sounds like it maybe would fall into that category, but, um, but nonetheless, um, I would support the, the amendment and uh, like to see where it goes through capital investment. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any, no more discussions on this amendment? Um, all those in favor of adopting the A1 say aye. 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 All opposed? No. 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 The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Other discussion on the bill? All right. Rep. Hansen, your last words on the bill? I'd appreciate your support, and if you want to take a tour, we'd be happy to just a few minutes away. All right. Thank you. Well, the chair renews her motion that House File uh, 189 be re, re referred to capital investment. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the bill is in, in its, okay, I'm choking on my words today. The bill is in, on its way to capital investment. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. The next bill on the calendar is uh, House File 1065. Um, Representative Hussein, welcome to the committee. I believe this is your first time in this committee. And you are also a freshman. 
It so is we my were first expecting time. treats today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I wish you could have let me know so I would have bring something, you know? No one has informed me, but next time. <laughs> you know, prior to COVID, we used to, um, we were the, the group that we were in 2019, when we first got here, we were the class of 2019, we were told that we have to bring treat to every new committee. And I remember <laughs> buying so much sambusa, so I was expecting sambusa today. But, but I'm blaming you and right. the rest of the team for not letting me know, but next time I'm ready. <laughs> okay. Madam uh, Chair, it might yes. be appropriate to tell the author that we're here most Wednesdays. And, uh, <laughs> I'll, uh, happy, there you go. Happy to take a uh, We're IOUs. happy to take a treat every, yeah. we're here yeah. every Wednesday, right? <laughs> All right, I'll promise. Um, well, My next um, bill. Yeah. All right, welcome, uh, Chair um, moves House File um, 1065 to be laid over for a possible inclusion um, in the omnibus bill. Rep. Hussein, uh, please explain your bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and uh, committee's members. Uh, this bill is about NDC, which is known as uh, Neighborhood Development Center, uh, which has been exist for many years since I was kid for the last three, the last 30 years, which has a good track record, uh, and it, it's been helping income and the minority businesses. And NDC has been managing five locations throughout the metro area, and also providing the skills, also providing technical, and, and if you have a small business, usually you do need some kind of help. And uh, it looks like they have been uh, given the lowest rate uh, for 2%, and not only providing loans, but also providing technical educations and giving a lot of times to out their uh, timing. And NDC also uh, expanding in greater Minnesota, uh, Duluth, St. Cloud, Brainerd, Middle Lock, and uh, lower Sioux indigenous community in uh, Moorhead, Minnesota. Also, uh, not only uh, creating businesses, also providing those uh, business ad, bringing sales tax, which is uh, $10.6 million for sales taxes in our state. And I'm happy uh, to have the founder of uh, NDC, which has uh, been champion for many in, in community throughout the state of Minnesota, Mike Terman. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Tamale, and uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed, please. Uh, my name is Mike Tamale. I'm the founder and now senior advisor of Neighbor Development Center. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Hussein. Um, so Neighbor Development Center has been working for 30 years in the lowest income neighborhoods of the Twin Cities with low to very low income folks to start their own business in their own neighborhoods. And this has basically been wraparound uh, type services, starting with training classes, since folks that want to start a business, uh, particularly in a lot of these neighborhoods, and if they haven't had a business before, uh, really need to start with a business plan, because the business plan is like where they get the reality check. And frankly, about only about 25% of the people who start our training class uh, end up in business, because the other 75% learn um, in the class that it's harder than they thought. Um, and maybe they put it off to a different time of their life, uh, for instance. Uh, this is an 11-week class, uh, like one night a week kind of thing. It's out in all these different communities. Um, they're in a small peer group of about 10 or 12 folks. Um, and then they graduate uh, and are ready to start, but they don't have any money. And these are by, almost by definition, because we work with low to very low income folks, uh, they tend to not be able to get uh, financing from a bank. So we have our own loan program, we call it character-based lending, uh, because the other C's of lending, their, their credit, their collateral, uh, their sort of proven capacity, are, tend to be pretty uh, slim uh, when they're just starting up like that. So we base a lot of our lending decisions on uh, what we learned about them as a person during the class, um, how they stuck with it, how they did the kind of stuff that's not that fun, like learning how to do books and studying their uh, competition, et cetera. So we do about 50 or 70 loans a year, uh, anywhere from a couple thousand bucks up to uh, almost half a million dollars. Um, we've gotten more and more into uh, real estate lending as the business is mature. 
Um, once they're in business, we provide free technical assistance to them uh, if they can't afford it, or if they can't afford it, we charge them for that. But this is anything from legal and accounting to uh, branding and, and um, marketing, et cetera. Um, and then finally, we help them uh, get good leases. We try to get them back in their own neighborhood uh, to really, our whole program is based on sort of building neighborhood economies from within. And so we want these folks to start the business in their own neighborhood if at all possible. So we help them with the leases, uh, just making sure they're signing a good lease and with the build out. Um, and we also build our own buildings uh, to house some of these businesses. So the Midtown Global Market, the Mercado Central, uh, Frogtown Crossroads at, Univer at University and Dale, et cetera, uh, are such uh, places. We have about uh, 80 businesses in our own buildings. Now we've been working around the state of Minnesota with a half a dozen communities that Representative Hussein mentioned. Um, we're not expanding out to there. We're teaching those communities how to do what we've done if they're interested. And then we pass along some of the funds that we have received uh, over some years from the state legislature and from uh, a few other funders to those communities to kick off the same program in their, in their community. Um, we are real big on accountability and third party evaluation. We've hired Wilder Research for most of our 30 years uh, to do a, an extensive survey of uh, hundreds of our entrepreneurs. We have about 700 in business today. And Wilder Research has come up with lots and lots of uh, the data that um, we've presented to you in the handout, uh, the 10.6 million a year of uh, sales and income tax, for instance. The average age of our businesses is 10 years, which is twice the state average. Um, so in the ask we have in front of the state legislature now, um, we're asking for some more loan capital, we're asking for some operating capital, uh, we're, we're asking for some capital to uh, invest in a business incubator in greater Minnesota uh, in a project like that. Um, and we're asking for some funds to, to uh, help develop uh, some new uh, developers, real estate developers uh, in probably in the Twin Cities here. Uh, we've been working with lots of uh, entrepreneurs that want to start building their own buildings and we work with them but we've never had any funding to do that. So that's the last part of our ask. Uh, if I can, I'd like to introduce Tony Gozi, Gozi now who is uh, one of our entrepreneurs. He's in one of our incubators up on the east side over here. Uh, it's a small contractor incubator and Tony is the owner of Native Air Mechanical. Sir, front and center. Yep. The left part. Sure. Welcome. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, good morning. My name is Tony Gozi. Uh, as Mr. Tamale mentioned, my name or my name of my company is uh, my small business is Native Air Mechanical. Uh, I am in the incubator, not too far down the road on East Seventh. Uh, I've been a clientele customer, uh, graduate of the NDC class that he mentioned uh, for over 15 years, about 15, 16 years ago I graduated that class and have moved into, a, I actually went back to that class to, to help um, with uh, just training and, and oversight of the instructors and, and being a, a realistic voice of, of what it takes to own a small business and run a small business in the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm here to testify that NDC has been extremely instrumental in not only my business um, over the last years, and we've literally borrowed and paid back hundreds of thousands of dollars that have that's created hundreds of jobs and and livable wage jobs, I might add. So, um, you know, employees that average W-2 annually, you know, seventy-five thousand dollars a year. Um, and so, uh, they've been instrumental. And they've they've been there when nobody else has. Um, as far as the borrowing, um, the, the funds to uh, help with purchasing of um, equipment and materials on projects all the way back to the first time we were on the, the Hmong Academy project next to the state fairgrounds there. Um, and um, they've um, helped out not only our business, but you know, as he mentioned, hundreds of others that are boots on the ground that are providing providing jobs and making a real difference in in a lot of people's lives in a positive way um, so at the end of the day I'd ask you to look at the bill and, and pass it forward because it makes a big difference for a lot of people 
Thank you very much. Any discussion on the bill? Rep. Smith. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to, it's, it's a comment. I, I really love this bill. Thank you, Representative Hussein, for bringing this forward. Um, I just want to highlight one particular part of this bill that I really, really like, and that's the $2 million for the high-risk character-based loans for non-recourse uh, loans that are used to leverage for $10 million in recourse lending. So this is $1.19, $1.20 on the bill. Um, I like it for a couple of reasons. One is this allows <clears throat> this particular moving money around to get more capital is something that high net worth individuals in our society are able to use all the time. Uh, and most small business owners just have no uh, recourse for this. So being able to fund capital to get more capital for this, I think is wonderful. Um, and uh, secondly, just kind of define some of those terms, uh, the non-recourse loans. What that means is that lenders can't come after small businesses that fail for everything that they own, for their, for their homes, for whatever else which I think is wonderful. We, we say all the time that every small business is an act of hope. Um, and sometimes hope doesn't work out. Um, but those individuals shouldn't be punished for the rest of their lives for this. So um, I love this bill. Gladly will uh, support it. Just wanted to thank you. And I'll be talking to you afterwards about maybe getting NDC to come down to Rochester. So thank you. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also just wanted to to um, share my support for this bill. I'm a proud co-author, and I wanted to lift up one of the like slightly un less sexy parts of it, but that really means a lot to me, um, which is the technical assistance in Greater Minnesota. Um, I was just thinking back to when I started my own law firm, that my law partner knew how to register with the Secretary of State. He knew how to set up our malpractice insurance. He does our books to this day, um, and that allowed me um, because I had the the capital um, I've shared in this committee, like help from my dad, and the social capital, you know, having a law partner who had that expertise and ability, um, it allowed me to be a success. And so I think the providing this type of technical assistance for people who don't have that the literal capital or social capital, um, I think is really important. So I just, I think this overall is a really great bill, and I, in particular, am excited about that aspect of it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Perryman. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have uh, a couple of, one question, basically. Uh, I really love the program. I, I live in St. Cloud, so I know it can really be impactful with the St. Cloud area as well. But over the, you've, you have um, got funding anywhere from $650,000 to $750,000. This is quite a larger request. So I'm just asking, um, um, the, um, since it is a higher request, a significantly higher request. How um, do you think you will monitor, you know, oversee it and, and the projects, how you will determine the projects, oversee the money, uh, since it is quite larger? Mike Tamale. So, Madam Chair and Representative Perryman, uh, you noticed, yeah, it's up, uh, what is that, 10 times? So, uh, yes, it is. Um, so, first of all, I mean, the, um, the core funding we've received in the past has been, like you said, either 650 or 750 a year, and so that part increased just to 800. So that was, you know, that's kind of our regular program, and it does keep increasing um, the demand for this in the Twin Cities. Um, the Greater Minnesota work we've had 150,000 a year. Well, it's, it's over a biennium, so it's 150 over a two-year period. We've had that, uh, I think, three times already, and the bulk of that we pass through to these communities to start their own program. And we also are training them and we provide the materials. So they basically, it's like plug and play kind of if they are interested and they learn how to do it themselves and, and we give them some starting capital from that 150. Um, the uh, incubator project in Greater Minnesota, we don't have a project yet for that. We have a, all these different partners. They're all interested in doing something like this, but if we, got this, we'd have to do some significant training of them. Real estate is hard, um, and it's not for um, every organization, so we'd have to be careful on how to do that. Uh, we do our own real estate development, so we know how hard it is. Uh, the uh, $2 million of uh, loan capital, um, that's basically added to the loan capital that we have and that we've been using. We have a loan staff of, I think, six people. Uh, we have a loan committee. Um, and we've been running that, you know, we, I think, have lent $30 million over the years. Uh, the leverage that was spoken about earlier, that comes usually from loans that we can get from foundations, uh, program-related investments, 
for which we put this two, two million into a loan loss reserve, and that's how we um, leverage the 10 million. That becomes a 20% loan loss reserve for us as we're making these sort of high touch, high risk loans. Um, but our historic write off is down around two or 3%. So it's a real, it's a healthy, um, it's a healthy reserve. But we are responsible for those loans to the foundations. So we have to cover our, our back too. And then the final one on uh, the three million for the emerging entrepreneur or the emerging developer fund, um, that would be uh, basically extending an existing body of work we've had for years. And, and the bulk of that is loans again. Uh, and we've been, we're, a, we're a community development financial institution. We've been that for our whole history. So it's a US Treasury Department funded and designated um, uh, classification. And so we have a very strong and robust uh, sort of lending uh, program, portfolio management, uh, uh, loan committee oversight, board oversight, auditor oversight, uh, et cetera. So I think, I think we're, uh, I mean, it's, it extends our ability to do things we've been doing all along, I guess I'd say, um, but just with more capital. Thank you. Okay. Representative Wiener, you had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe that the uh, the question I had was basically re on reporting and oversight again. Um, I was concerned, and uh, the incubator that was mentioned, um, if there was a location. So both of the questions, concerns I had, um, were answered. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you um, for coming to share today both your experience as a business owner and. Um, uh, participant in this program and then just some of the some of the wonderful work that NDC has done in in Minnesota and um, all around the state I'm uh, particularly excited about the greater Minnesota development so um, I while I represent the suburbs here I'm a property owner in Otter Tail County and I have extended family in the Wadena Deer Creek area um, I don't know if many of you know but the downtown Wadena area is experiencing a bit of a renaissance um, so if you if you like uh, I'm gonna shout out to drastic measures brewing in particular it's one of my favorite um, outstate breweries but um, I digress uh, really excited about this because we know that um, particularly throughout COVID with the opportunity to work remotely um, lots of folks want a little bit of that down downtown small town living and people are able to uh, find it in so many parts of Minnesota so um, I just I want to make sure that um, that you know we're we're looking at that expansion I think the technical technical assistance is really important that's something that you guys have done before looking at um, incubator development um, Representative Smith mentioned Rochester, but I think, I mean, a lot of this, just making sure that, that entrepreneurial minds all across the state of Minnesota are getting the support that they need, and I'm really excited about that part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Koslowski. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to our testifiers and Representative Hussein for bringing this forward. Um, I also want to specifically say miigwech to our testifier, Tony. I think you are exactly what it is when we're talking about how we're rebuilding and reclaiming our generational wealth and health and how that's going to lift up our families and our community and our economy. Um, so I wanna say thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited about this bill and the work that you are like doing and the opportunity to continue to make further robust investments. Um, in Greater Minnesota and Duluth, we have benefited greatly from the partnership um, and your sharing uh, this model with our community. We've seen um, within our program serving any population, but especially our black, brown, and indigenous folks, um, and especially our youth. We have programs that help introduce youth to entrepreneurial opportunities from a young age. and that's very good to be able to start showing our people that we can be doctors and lawyers and we can go to edge in into you know two and four year apprenticeship programs and we can also be entrepreneurs and hey sometimes we do it all at the same time um, i also want to say specifically about the technical assistance how important that is also um, just jumping off of what's been shared we know the lots of barriers into the finances but there's also just simple things of like how do I create a website and how do I what type of a business um, should I file for also child care and cultural supports and I've seen um, in our community how 
um, that's been used to, you know, folks are single parents or they've got multiple kids or they're, they're taking care of um, cousins and whatnot. And so that's really crucial to be able to um, have those wraparound supports. And in our, my community in Greater Minnesota, we see a lot of our businesses of color are actually operating out of their homes or out of their car online. Um, and so I'm especially curious about the incubator space. Um, that's one of the things we hear over and over and over again, that um, that lack of ability to be able to get into our own space, but then have the capital to be able to make it our own. Um, so I'm just curious if you could talk to us a bit about that concentrated and affordable commercial space. Um, what will the lease and rates look like for entrepreneurs who are interested in taking their business, you know, in out of their homes and in into the storefront? Mike Tamale, do you want to take that? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and the chairs are blocking your sign, so I didn't catch. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Representative Kozlowski. Uh, so we have sort of two basic components of the real estate side of, of our uh, model, and the one I mentioned earlier, which is helping people lease good spaces that are good for their business under a good lease, um, and then getting assistance on all the many things you have to do to build that space out and to open the business because you might be good at baking or hair or cars or whatever it is but it generally doesn't make you good at um, navigating city red tape uh, architects contractors um, and dealing with the law in so many different ways um, uh, and so that's that's probably the bulk of what we're helping our 700 entrepreneurs with year after year. And then financing those tenant improvements because financing tenant improvements is hard because you're basically fixing up somebody else's building for your business. But you might have a three year lease, mm -hmm. so who's gonna give you fi financing to do that? Um, on the incubator side of things, these are projects that we've built ourselves or that we've partnered with other groups to build. And, um, and the whole idea there is what we call long-term affordable commercial spaces that are going to be uh, places where these entrepreneurs can be successful to start their business and to grow their business. Um, and the rates are basically uh, consistent with um, what's, the, what's the square footage rate uh, in that exact area for older buildings, even though we've either built new buildings or fixed up buildings. So we, we have to bring in uh, grant money and you know foundation money donations from individuals uh, up front to bring the cost way down so that a coffee shop or a hair salon can actually um, pay the rent so in terms of in ours you know we work here in, in the Twin Cities uh, anywhere from 10 bucks to 20 bucks a square foot on, on an annual basis is a is a, kind of the range of uh, base rent and we typically don't charge a cam um, so anybody who knows real estate knows that that's pretty affordable. Um, we have been working in your town of Duluth with Family Freedom Center, uh, and they have an incubator idea on their mind. I'm gonna hear about this next week, so we'll see. I'm always cautious because real estate development causes major brain damage for anybody who does it, and, and organizational stress. So like I said earlier, you have to you have to be set up properly to take this on, and you can work with partners, you can work with private sector partners, public sector partners, nonprofits, whatever. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, and our thing in Greater Minnesota is always about training communities to do this same type of work, uh, not us. At, we're never the ones out there training or lending entrepreneurs individually. It's, it's building little ecosystems in each of these places to, to do the same kind of work. Do you have a follow-up question? Or? Yeah, just to say thank you for, for that. Um, that's exactly what we've seen in, um, you know, communities who may, or entrepreneurs who end up folding because of all of those, not having that uh, robust support, support. So I look forward to the added capacity and to your point of the ecosystem, being able to work with our city and our business chambers and our business councils um, and bringing all of those resources together is really, I think, uh, the key to making this successful across our community. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Lead Kosnick. Thanks, ma'am, or Madam Chair. And I know we have a, another bill after this, but I think we have plenty of time. Okay. Um, appreciate the work. you're gonna ask tons of questions? 
<laughs> no, no. I, 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 well, my point is, is I, I, you know, I appreciate the work that uh, NDC has been doing, and Mr. Tamale has. Um, work in the communities and his commitment to this over a long time. I've known you for a few few years in sessions. Um, one thing, I'd, I'd like to get his insight a little bit because I think we do have time uh, on the economic outlook and how that will, what your thoughts are, what you're seeing coming down the road for the broader economy and how that relates to some of the businesses that uh, you help with. Um, as a committee, we haven't talked a lot about that, but then also, uh, Madam Chair, he had mentioned the Wilder Research um, study that they did and just a friendly suggestion that maybe uh, a presentation at one of our future committee hearings, uh, I'd be curious to see what, what they ca came up with and kind of help us understand some of that stuff. But if we have time, I'd love to hear, um, take advantage of his expertise and, and just some brief comments on the economic outlook. Okay, Mr. Tamale. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Kozlek. Um, well, first of all, I'm not an economist, and second of all, I tend to work with entrepreneurs as individual people, and I put, you know, our whole model is basically focused on each of them as uh, a strong person with lots of uh, potential, um, and in a weird way, we don't, um, at least I, I guess we probably have other folks on our staff that are way smarter at this than I am, but um, if someone's, if someone's a real entrepreneur, uh, we're gonna do everything we can to help them, whether there's already 10 barbers on that street and they wanna do a barber shop, we're gonna find out why they think they can make it. We're gonna watch them, you know, month after month as they're getting ready. Um, uh, we might try to talk them into going to a different street in this little example. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you're gonna, you can be on a rising trend and a lousy entrepreneur and you're not gonna make it and you can be on a, on a, in a tough you know, niche of the market or the economy uh, and just by uh, creativity and persistence you can make it. So that's a little bit sidestepping your question and I apologize for that, but uh, that's a lot of how we go about this. Uh, that said, we're not oblivious to trends. Um, uh, another thought that crosses my mind is that when, when the general economy gets tough, we get busier, the demand goes up, uh, people get laid off, people that weren't low income like two months ago now are, uh, so they fit our program and, and it's amazing what percentage of the population has a little business idea in the back of their mind. I mean, you can talk to almost anybody and they've thought about, you know, starting something at some point in their life and if you get laid off, if, if um, you know, if you're gonna do an early retirement or whatever it may be, uh, people, you know, come to us at, at uh, really interesting times in their life and, and uh, uh, so I'd say in general, focusing on, focusing more and more attention like your committee does by the state, by the private sector, by the nonprofit sector on these small, uh, on the small business sector in general. I mean, if you look at how the deed budget and even the recent uh, federal dollars that came through SSBIC, um, four of those six programs are really oriented at tech and high growth and bigger businesses, which is fine, they're huge impact also. But I guess our opinion is we could spend more, a higher percentage uh, of our attention and resources on these smaller businesses and then, and then the entrepreneurs sort of tell us where they think there's an opportunity and, and um, it's very much a crawl before you walk, walk before you run process. Um, so that's different than how an economist would answer your question, obviously. Um, but our businesses are on average in business for 10 years. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's Wilder Research Evaluation. So they're doing something right once they actually take the plunge. Um, and we see this in greater Minnesota just as much as in Frogtown or the east side, uh, without a doubt. I think what we've been out preaching is getting more, more communities building these ecosystems that can do this wraparound type services because if you just have a loan fund uh, for, for these startups, for these higher risk, uh, higher touch business, just loan capital by itself doesn't work. But just training folks without loan capital, that doesn't work either. You need the both of them and you need the longer term hand holding 
Um, so that's why these sort of ongoing ecosystems is what we're committed to building out uh, in any community that's interested in that. Do you have a follow-up? No, thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate uh, the intent of the bill. All right. We have one more question. Uh, Representative Smith. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Kosnick uh, convinced me that I could ask more questions because we have time. <laughs> so, um, I'm just curious. So we know from SBA data that nationwide, the last two years have seen uh, a huge rise in new businesses being formed. Obviously, a lot of that is related to pandemic and, and uh, single entity and a lot of other things. But I'm curious if have you seen that reflected in the last two years, specifically in your organization, in whether it's here or in Greater Minnesota. Mr. Tamale, sorry. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Smith, so you're asking if we've seen a rise in uh, the number of folks trying to start businesses? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Absolutely. That's the question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get better at this. Um, <laughs> you're um, good, so. Yeah, I mean, um, that's why we kind of keep expanding, but we're also, um, we study our own failures uh, closely and we study uh, folks that get into business and fail and we, try, and we study folks that don't, you know, that take our class and then don't go into business because each of those are, um, they're informative. Uh, we don't treat failure as a negative for an entrepreneur, although it's traumatic for them and their families, um, but man, do they learn a lot. And, uh, and if they are ready to start, a, uh, you know, start again, uh, we're all in with that. Uh, and we do the same with our own program. So we've started a program recently called Block, which is for black and Latina, Latina uh, women. Uh, that's a peer group where there's, they've come through the class, they mostly launched their businesses, but it's an ongoing support group just for that uh, demographic and and those I think it's like I don't know 15 or 20 women it's an amazing scene to sit and watch watch how how strong they are together and how much they uh, value that uh, so you know that's one example we've done we've done a lot with um, the technology for the small businesses uh, to get uh, POS systems going to get websites going to get branding going uh, to get social media driving businesses their way. So obviously COVID accelerated the shift away from brick and mortar. Um, so that's sort of fundamentally a challenge for every town in Minnesota and for every uh, street in, in the Twin Cities here. Um, but it's also an opportunity for every single business to have a whole new way of getting customers. And you know, the older entrepreneurs uh, a lot of times are intimidated by that type of uh, sort of online uh, side of their business, but a lot of them have kids and those kids know all about it. And they, so we'll work with both generations um, and help them drive new, uh, new sales and bring in new customers in that fashion. Those are just a couple examples, I guess. Do you have a follow up? No, thank you. Oh, thank you, okay. Well, I'll add my two cents before we give uh, Representative Hussein uh, his final comments. Um, both the uh, Global Midtown and um, Mercado Central are in my district, and I have seen the work of uh, NDC work with, um, you know, small businesses. Um, I remember when the pandemic hit and everything went online, one of the biggest problems was trying to work with the small business owners who don't have you know, they don't have um, accountants, they don't have lawyers, and they don't know how to use a computer, or they have never used a computer, or they don't own one, trying to get documents scanned online and applying loans and grants online. And I, I, and I have seen NDC step up. Uh, that's why I'm super excited about the technical assistance, because that, that, was, that was the work that they did, it was to help some of those businesses um, find an individual in, in, in their office helps, um, you know, a business owner who has all their documents in paper and don't know how to scan any of it or apply any of the grants or the, the, the loans that were, you know, always time sensitive. And if you miss the deadline, you don't get, you don't get a chance to redo. So thank you for all the work that you have done. I'm very appreciative of uh, you and your staff and your entity, and I'm, excited that you guys are expanding it to greater Minnesota as well. 
Thank you. Representative Hussein, last words on your uh, bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, my colleagues for uh, accepting this great uh, organization who has been doing a great work throughout Minnesota and now trying to expand it in the greater Minnesota. I'm really excited about that. Also, uh, I wanted to thank uh, NDC for providing the skills and giving 11 million grand drink uh, uh, the, the time of the COVID, the difficult times that we've been seeing for many small businesses, we were able to step up and help for our community. And I wanted to thank, there's uh, 700 existing, existing NDC businesses, and I would like to see uh, more uh, opportunity across the, can, uh, across the state. And we always talk about equity and economic disparities. This is the right uh, uh, organization that will be stepping up and to provide for a small business. And I want to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to hear about this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I renew my motion that House File 1065 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you. Our next um, bill is House File 752. We'll bring you back for a presentation of that study sometime. <laughs> Representative Finke, welcome to the committee. Um, I move that House File um, 752 will be re referred to the capital investment. Uh, please explain your bill. Thank you, Chair Hassan, for this opportunity to come and hear 752 uh, and to the members of the committee for your consideration. Uh, HF 752 is a $3 million appropriation from the general fund for an organization called Film North. Um, film North is a, a local filmmaking organization that seeks to tell stories of all of our residents of Minnesota. Uh, the project that we're talking about today is a $12 million private-public partnership uh, with 60% of the total funds already raised. Uh, this investment will allow Film North to move forward in, in so many ways. Uh, it, it is based in the rehabilitation of a historic building in uh, University Avenue uh, in my district. Um, but it will also allow them to grow their filmmaking lab uh, for inclusive and socially responsible filmmaking. Some of you may know uh, that I am a filmmaker. Um, before my time here, I was a documentary filmmaker. I own a production company. I'm a small business owner. And um, I believe very deeply in the powerful, um, virtuous nature of telling stories. Um, I believe that stories are what allows us to live together and to find peace together and understand and build empathy about our world. Um, and any endeavor that we can do to increase that work um, needs to be supported, and especially in these moments. Um, so there's great many details about this. There's a lot of jobs that this will create. There's a lot of um, economic support. There's partnerships. But for that material, I am going to turn it over to um, Andrew Peterson, who I have with me here today, Executive Director at Film North. Welcome. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you. I'm Andrew Peterson. I'm the executive director of Film North. Uh, I want to thank you, Representative Finke, uh, all the co-authors of this bill, Madam Chair, and the committee for the opportunity to share a little bit about what we do. Um, Film North was founded in 1987. Uh, it's uh, the largest filmmaker service organization in the Upper West, Midwest and one of the largest and most successful in the country. We provide education and professional development for media artists and all artists who, uh, in all disciplines that incorporate media into their work. Uh, based in St. Paul, we actually serve artists throughout the entire state and region. We do this through after school programs, continuing education, summer camps, seminars, workshops, and panels, and professional development programs that train media artists enter this 192 billion dollar industry uh, and enter the creative co uh, economy in Minnesota. Uh, in our youth programs, 70 percent are kids of color, 90 percent qualify for free or reduced lunch. Every kid that walks through the door, we tell them that they have a voice and that their stories matter. Um, 
Uh, many of you may not know that artists living and working in Minnesota, many of them are creating the films and television shows you're probably watching, uh, all from their desks and homes and offices in Minnesota, from Amazon and Netflix, Hulu and Apple TV and major networks. Uh, Michael Starry is a great example. I started 10 years ago. He had, didn't have a credit to his name and in 2019 was nominated for an Emmy for the Netflix series When They See Us. Uh, with some of the most exciting work that's happening right now is within our indigenous communities. Uh, Lyle Mitchell Corbine, Missy Hale, Leah Hale, uh, Leah Hale, Missy Whiteman, and Rihanna Yazzie are all creating just spectacular work that are, that you'll see on TPT at Sundance Film Festival. Lyle Corbine was just in Sundance last year and nominated for four Independent Spirit Awards for his work. Uh, you'll be seeing and hearing much more about them. And it, uh, they represent the diversity in front of and behind the camera that, that Film North really uh, champions and looks to uh, to, uh, to uh, move forward. Uh, our new home is a, tw uh, we will anchor a 24,000 square foot center that will also have an outdoor green space. It's designed for the community with the community in mind, what the community needs and bringing community together around stories and storytelling. Uh, the uh, cinemas, uh, indoor and outdoor, are designed to support long-term partners that are BIPOC-led uh, film festivals, Arab American, Hmong, Indigenous, uh, and uh, screening series for In the Footstep of Gordon Parks are all people we've worked with before. These are, uh, this provides a St. Paul home and a permanent home where audiences can find them and they can expand their programming to year round, not just for the four or five days of their festivals. Um, as outlined by uh, Representative Ficke, our project will cre uh, it's going to create jobs, about 46 jobs we, we estimate in, uh, in the near term. They're all cre in the creative economy and education. We employ a lot of instructors um, as well. Um, there's um, as over 60% of this is raised. Um, and uh, uh, I, oh, and I wanted to, sorry, I meant to, I would like to introduce uh, uh, on our team, uh, Bethany uh, Gladhill, who is uh, an, an integral partner in this with me and our business director at Film North. Welcome, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Bethany Gladhill. I've been the business director of Film North, came in at the same time as Andrew in interim leadership and over 10 years later, we're still here helping this organization grow and reach some new exciting areas. The project for me has been especially exciting because my background is not only in nonprofit arts administration, but also in historic preservation. So the work on an adaptive use of this historic building at Clarence Johnson designed warehouse, which is not usual. Usually you're looking at large houses on Summit Avenue or the University of Minnesota, but to take this building that was built as a warehouse uh, built for that community and as a showroom and to make this into a creative center, I think really demonstrates this area, this part of the community and what we can showcase in the future. We're excited to be in this building. We're bringing in our partners who are uh, DNO architects uh, and other creative enterprises. We've got uh, Orion Corporation, which is social services that will be coming in and some other lease elements. We're really excited to have this be a destination and some place that we can bring in partners and continue to go out throughout the state. Thank you. We have an amendment, uh, A1 amendment. Uh, Rep. Wiener, uh, please move your amendment and explain. I'd like to move my amendment A1 forward, Madam Chair. All right, would you explain what the amendment does? Uh, once again, this amendment would um, set some timelines guidelines, a uh, firm believer in, in having some completion dates and so forth, and, and when we're working on projects, we always want to see things focused and moving forward. The other thing is, once again, um, uh, uh, status reports, you know, at the completion. How do we gauge our success and failures if we're not getting the information back in order to observe and learn from these projects? Uh, so, once again, uh, that would be my amendments. Thank you. Representative um, Finke. Uh, thank you, Chair Hassan and Representative for your amendment. Um, this bill is moving forward to the Capital Investment Committee where um, it feels like this is, a, this is an amendment that maybe should live there. I do know that we have some um, reporting requirements involved and I, I understand exactly what the, the heart of this is, um, but I would ask that we um, bring it to capital investment before we start amending it. Thank you. Any other discussion on the amendment? I do actually, if it goes, Go ahead. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, if it goes through capital investment, does the reports and stuff still come through and 
how would we know that would be added on at that time? Representative Binky. Um, it would be up to someone in capital investment to provide an amendment, I believe. All right. Madam Chair. Uh, so what we could speak to in this, go in this ahead. process, I'm sorry, uh, what we could speak to in this process is that part of our funding is through new market tax credits uh, for this area and historic tax credits. We're one of the last projects approved last year. We do have uh, both robust funding from that uh, and requirements in terms of completion dates and in terms of reporting from that. We would be happy to share that with members of this body or anyone else that will be a very public process. And I'm also told that D does reporting and um, we're sent that report, so this will be included in that reporting. I'm new here, so I'm just passing the information that was passed to me. Uh, so we do get reporting on all of these projects. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, that does help a little bit, but you know, we've talked about this in other committees as well, even looking at bills retroactively to make sure that the money, the taxpayers' money that we're spending is being spent effectively and usefully um, so that's always my concern. We, we hold the responsibility of the taxpayers, you know, and these reports are actually for a person like me who is new as well, and I can look back and say, okay, this is what happened on a project in the past, moving forward, because, you know, I might not be here a next term, who knows? So this would be the opportunity for the next representative to look at those reports and say, this was successful, this wasn't, and this is the reason why. And I think that reporting is important, and I, I believe it should be added onto this, uh, this bill. Thank you, Representative Wiener. Uh, we all care about accountability here, and we want to make sure that we are doing the right thing. And, um, and this bill has another stop, so it's going to capital investment, um, and I'm sure someone else in the capital investment <laughs> will have the same questions that you have um, and, and raise them there. Um, it's the first stop is here, but it's going to another committee, and um, I have another member in, in the list who wants um, to um, have a comment on this or a question. Representative Katisa Watun. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my guess, my question to the amendment is, um, and maybe to uh, either House Research or um, House Fiscal, um, the, the text on line 1.3 that this project is considered abandoned, um, and I appreciate the definition of material progress, but I, I'm not, super familiar with like seeing language that says like this project is considered abandoned in in a six month time period i'm just curious like is that is that typical with with you know organizations that come to us for a, an appropriation that 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 language i mean is that a common language or a common requirement that we then re retract that um appropriation for um like for that six month time period. It just seems really soon. And, um, and I'm familiar, I'm more familiar with seeing like, you know, the, the, this funding is available until XYZ date. So I'm just curious um, if, if that's. Ms. Anna. Uh, Anna Schilling House Research. It, this is not common language in the economic development area. Uh, project funding being available to abandon is quite common in the capital investment bonding area uh, when you're doing capital projects. Uh, the six-month term for county as being abandoned is not something I have seen before. It may be something that has been seen, though not as commonly, in capital investment. Thank you. You have a follow-up? Yeah, just really quick. I, I appreciate that. Um, and I've never served on the Capital Investment Committee, um, but, but been on um, workforce and, and um, economic development previously. So I, I just I want to make sure. I mean, things, things can take time, and I think um, I don't want to be pulling the funding out from underneath a, a really good project should we decide to move forward with it or should the capital investment committee decide to move forward with it um, before they're able to, to get things off the ground. So um, I would oppose the amendment for that reason. Thank you. Representative Finke, do you have a, a comment? Yeah, I would just like to point out that, you know, I, I, I definitely understand that we need to be good stewards of this money. Um, I believe deeply in accountability and financial responsibility and understanding what we're doing with our money. I also believe that this is, um, this is the process under which we do this, in which we find ourselves being asked, is this a project that we believe this money is um, worthy of? Um, and I will also just say that this is a project that is um, shovel ready, it's ready to go. Uh, it is 
a small portion of the overall funding for this project, most of which has already been raised. Um, so I know that's not going to satisfy the question, right? We need the reports, we need the follow-up, but it does sound like that follow-up also will be coming as a part of the existing deed reporting. Thank you. Um, all those in favor of adapting the AWOD amendment, please say aye. 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 I voted wrong, so sorry. Just the voice Chair button. votes. <laughs> um, opposed, please say nay. 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 All right, the motion doesn't carry and the amendment is not adopted. Uh, discussion on the bill. Representative uh, Feist. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just big picture comment. I love this bill. Um, I'm. I'm an artist in my own way, writing and drawing, and so I just love supporting the arts here in the legislature. I have a super wonky question for you. Um, I have been tasked with sort of thinking about free and reduced lunch forms and where they pop up in a lot of contexts, um, because as we move forward with free meals for all students, those free and reduced lunch forms are going to become less important. Um, and they already have um, in the school setting um, because they've been replaced with the Medicaid direct certification. So I was curious, um, when you have those counts, do you use the free and reduced lunch counts in other contexts when you're applying for grants and do you have thoughts on other metrics that you could look to when you're looking at the demographics of the children that you work with in your program? Um, Bethany okay. may be able to, oh sorry, no, I'm new to this too. Oh, <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Peterson. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, uh, with our grant reporting, we are often given the, the metrics to use and we and we respond with them. Uh, we, uh, so it's, it's, it's well, while I agree with you, I don't think it's a perfect way to, uh, to account for it. It's what we've been, it's our requirement that we operate under. Do you have a follow up? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So those grants would be from like any variety of organizations that you see yeah. funding from? Yeah, State Arts Board and, and, uh, and also um, uh, private foundations and, uh, and some individuals as well. Interesting. Right. Cool. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Representative Shang. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so I, do, I sit on the Capital Investment Committee um, and I'm working on a project that's similar to what you guys are doing the Funding Asian Women Collective Group, and they're seeking uh, to construct a uh, theater facility for them, uh, but they were a private entity, and now they're working on their C3, and they have a fiscal uh, sponsor. I'm just curious, are you guys a private entity or a C3? Uh, we're a 501C3. Go through the chair, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry I keep forgetting. <laughs> so far, All right, Mr. Peterson. Thank you, sorry. Um, the, uh, uh, we're, we're a 501c3, and uh, we work very, very closely with that organization. Naomi Ko is a, is a past grantee of ours and is a lead uh, artist uh, in that. It's, uh, we need more organizations, we need more facilities. Uh, Film North is a leader and we, will part and we partner with everyone here, so it's like we're excited about that project. Rob Shang, do you have a follow-up? No, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I just asked because we're, we're actually going through some hurdles and I want to get them some funding too, so. I appreciate knowing where you guys are. Maybe I'm, I might even want to have a follow-up conversation with you guys. Happy to. How we can help get them some funding too. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Up next, we have Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I love this. Uh, I love uh, film. My question, from an economic perspective, is uh, you talked a lot in your presentation about um, artists accessing this area, but you also did mention a cinema, and so I kind of wanted to. Uh, just nail down and ask specifically some questions about how accessible that you mentioned programming potentially year round. Has there been any, any thought on, I, I'm just thinking if you're getting state funds, um, you know, making sure ticket prices are affordable for um, these and potentially, you know, free for certain parties so that they can access the art, not just the artists who make them. So I'm, I'm curious if that has been a consideration at all. Mr. Peterson. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Representative Smith. Uh, uh, most of our programs are free, and we design them to be accessible. We also have low income uh, uh, pricing structures for our classes, as well as a scholarship, a generous or underwritten scholarship program. Um, accessibility and removing barriers is a core principle for us, and is something that uh, when everybody has a story to tell, everybody needs access to, uh, to the, the means by which they can, they can learn and, and create. So uh, uh, that accessibility is baked into us. 
you have a follow-up, Mr. Uh, Representative Smith? Uh, yeah, just a, maybe one quick uh, follow-up, Madam Chair. Just, so is your programming uh, films that are only made through the film notes and through this area, or are you, you know, distributing other things from around the world or other um, parts of the state? Mr. Peterson. Thanks. Uh, we uh, uh, were called Film North to represent that the Dakotas, Iowa, and Western Wisconsin in particular don't have a resource, and we find that we have a limited number of people that will then naturally come to us for advice. Anybody who is, uh, for instance, based in, in another state but making a film about a topic in Minnesota or something uh, that involves Minnesota uh, issues or, per, or people, often uh, we, we work with, we have a fiscal sponsorship program which allows us to work really closely and, and uh, uh, dig into their financials and their business plans and, and help uh, and their marketing and other uh, aspects of their projects, but the core group that we work with are Minnesota artists uh, and uh, throughout the state. We do uh, most, uh, we, while we have work everywhere, Duluth, St. Cloud, and Rochester are our core, and also the Fargo-Moorhead area are core areas where we do regular programming and engage with artists there. Many of our artists are also small business owners and independent uh, contractors, so we do a lot of advice as well, not just about the creation of art, but the creation of art businesses. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Hansen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Finky, for bringing this forward. I have said since I started coming into this body and doing this work that storytelling changes the world. So I just want to tell you thank you for amplifying the voices of Minnesotans and making sure that the stories of our people here of diverse backgrounds are heard. So thank you. Thank you. Um, with no further discussion, uh, Representative Finke, you have the last word. Mm. Thank you, Chair Hassan and members for your questions and uh, support. Um, there's not much left to say. Uh, we have a very vibrant um, filmmaking industry in the Twin Cities. Uh, a lot of people don't realize just how vibrant and alive it is. Uh, this is a really exciting project. Um, the, the prospect of an outdoor cinema in my district is very exciting to me. There is um, there's a lot of potential for how this could help the community and I um, am grateful for your support. Thank you. Uh, I will renew my motion that House File 752 be re-referred to the Capital Investment Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. no. Motion carries and Congratulations, you are on your way to uh, Capital Investment Committee. With no final um, business, uh, we are adjourned. Thanks. Congratulations.